I'm Stephen Rinell, the host of the Meat Eater podcast and the Netflix original series Meat Eater. As a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, the question comes up, how can you justify killing and eating animals that you love and protect? Well, that's part of what we wrangle with on the Meat Eater podcast, along with broader and often funnier discussions about living an outdoor life in the modern world. Listen to the Meat Eater podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Monster, DC Sniper, a production of iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent those of iHeartMedia, Tenderfoot TV, or their employees. Listener discretion is advised. It is February 16th, 2002, and my niece is gone. This is Isa Nichols, the former accountant for John and Mildred Muhammad. She came home from grocery shopping one day to find that her niece, Kenya Cook, had been shot dead in her kitchen. I just went into a cold state. I was just on autopilot. My body had just shut down. They started roping off the house, and I saw where Kenya's head had laid. The bullet casing was still there, and I just saw blood. The back of her head had just been blown out. Now my house is a crime scene. We go through burying Kenya, and our family is grieving. It's a cold case, and we don't hear anything, and we're trying to go on with our lives. I'm no longer in the house at this point for several months. But when I do move back into my home, we're trying to get back into some sense of normalcy, if there's such a thing. But my husband and I, we were just going through the motions. And one day I was at Bible study. This is like the end of October. My pager is going off. It was my husband. I go and I return the call and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm at Bible study. It's Thursday. He said, have you looked at the TV? I said, I just said I was at Bible study. He said, no, 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 no. You need to go home. Meet me at the house. And I'm like, why? What's going on? He said, just meet me at the house. I get to the house and I turn on the TV and we have been hearing about these shootings on the East Coast. We're hearing just shots of people pumping gas. A child was shot at school. We're hearing about a woman getting shot in the head, coming out of Home Depot. I think she was an FBI analyst. So everybody's like, well, this ain't a time to be traveling to the East Coast. I actually had clients who canceled flight plans because this was going on. We're listening to all this news and stuff on the West Coast, and then all of a sudden... The backyard of a duplex here in Tacoma carefully marked off in a grid. Up pops a tree trunk at a former client's house. For almost nine hours, a deliberate search by hand, investigators sifting through dirt, then sawing down a tree stump and carting it off. Evidence believed to have been used for target practice, possibly containing bullet fragments. There's these helicopters flying all over the Tacoma community. There's FBI agents, ATF. Well, why is the investigation coming to Washington? The D.C. sniper, they are actually saying it's linked to Tacoma. At that point, in my soul, in my heart, in my mind, I knew I was connected. I'm on the couch in fetal position. The next thing you know, my husband comes home, and he said, that's what I was trying to tell you. It's John. It's John. There is a ruthless person on the loose. What unnerves this community the most is the randomness of the murders. Ordinary people doing ordinary things. They killed the five people in one day and then went on the rampage for the next month. It is quite a mystery. The police say they have never had a crime quite like this. Be careful. These guys are using weapons that are going to go right straight through our bulletproof vest. There's a white van just went by with two guys in it. From iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV, this is Monster, DC Sniper. October 22nd, 2002. It had been nearly three weeks since the DC sniper attacks began. The investigation had become the largest manhunt in the nation's history, which meant that expenses for every police agency involved were skyrocketing. Law enforcement had limited resources and limited time to catch the killers, so they had to act fast. Three days had passed since Jeffrey Hopper became the sniper's 12th victim at a Ponderosa Steakhouse in Ashland, Virginia. Since that time, investigators had connected the DC shootings to a liquor store robbery in Montgomery, Alabama. There, police found a fingerprint on an Armalite gun catalog. Federal authorities ran that fingerprint through the database of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS, and they got a match. The fingerprint belonged to Lee Boyd Malvo. As soon as we found out that his name was referenced in an INS file, we had them pull the file so we could see what was in it. And the other name that came up in that file was actually John Muhammad. This is Linda Hooper. She was a supervisory special agent for the FBI during the sniper investigation. Hooper immediately started to learn everything she could about Malvo and Muhammad. And in doing research on John Muhammad, we found out that he had been in the Army. He certainly knew weapons. 
the more we dug into his background and who he was, there was more and more information on his interest in weapons, his shooting, practice shooting, target shooting, his involvement with this young boy, 17-year-old Malvo. They weren't related, but Malvo lived with him. He had a very rough, to say the least, early childhood and not a good situation with his mother. And he was kind of taken in by John Muhammad. Much of this information came from a man in Tacoma, Washington, named Robert Holmes. He had called the Sniper Task Force with a tip. And he had said that he'd had a friend that had left the area that was a, a very militant person, a very uh, upset person. This is Michael Myrick, a former lieutenant for the Montgomery, Alabama police. Myrick says the tipster, Robert Holmes, was a former friend of Muhammad's, and he had served in the military alongside Muhammad. He described him as just being very unhappy with life. The guy was very dangerous, and he said, uh, it just bothers me that all this is happening. His ex-wife lives in the D.C. area, and he said uh, he left with an AR-15 Bushmaster rifle. He says, nothing for nothing, but I'm just going to let y'all know. Don't want to sit on this information. And he had a son named uh, Lee. The friend thought this was his son, at least stepson. And he said uh, his son was a very, very good shot, and they talked about snipers, and they played sniper games. Isa Nichols actually knew Robert Holmes, the man in Tacoma who called in the tip about John Muhammad. Well, John stayed with him. He was a good friend of John. They both were in Fort Lewis together in the military, both of them former Army vets. Holmes said that a few months before the shooting started in D.C., Muhammad stopped by his house. He wanted to test out a homemade silencer for a rifle. And in order to see if it worked, he had target practice in his backyard in one of the trees. And so that's why they were here, getting the tree trunk, and how the investigation came here. The tip from Robert Holmes effectively connected Washington State to the D.C. sniper attacks. So the sniper task force went to Tacoma. They took the tree stump that Muhammad and Malvo had supposedly used as target practice for evidence. Following the bullet trail, FBI agents are now focused on this wood pile in Olympia. Pieces of potential evidence. The wood cut down months ago from the backyard of this Tacoma duplex. It's where John Allen Muhammad once lived and is said to have used the tree for target practice. Authorities mapped a grid in the backyard and carefully scanned for bullet fragments and shell cases, then removed the stump from that tree sent to the wood pile. NBC News has learned evidence recovered here, including the tree stump, has been analyzed at the ATF lab in Maryland, and already the evidence has been described as having, quote, potential value. Again, all this is happening not in days, it's happening in hours. Now we had a very, very clear suspect to pursue by name. Police had quickly learned a lot about the pair, but they weren't ready yet to name them the snipers. Still, it felt to investigators like they were finally zeroing in on their targets. Meanwhile, Isa Nichols was getting some answers about the murder of her niece, Kenya Cook. Next thing I know, I get a knock at the door. It's the FBI agent. Well, he confirms that Lee and John were in Tacoma during the time my niece was murdered. And that's all I needed to hear. That said to me that they killed my niece. She took a bullet meant for me. Nobody knew she was living with me. She opens the door and he lodges off his, his weapon. I didn't realize how he became this diabolical, evil person. But Muhammad and Malvo weren't done yet. While the task force was making the connection to Washington State, Muhammad and Malvo were in Montgomery County, Maryland, and they were planning their next attack. I'm Stephen Rinella, host of the Meat Eater podcast and the Netflix original series Meat Eater. As a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, the question comes up, how can you justify killing and eating animals that you love and protect? Well, that's part of what we wrangle with on the Meat Eater podcast, along with broader and often funnier discussions about living an outdoor life in the modern world. Listen to the Meat Eater podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. October 22nd, 2002, Aspen Hill, Maryland, in Montgomery County. It's early in the morning, so early that it's still dark out. In a dense wooded area, someone is walking up a hill. They're carrying a duffel bag with a sniper rifle inside. Once they reach the edge of the wooded area, they stop. At the opening, they see an empty playground with rusty slides, still swings, and old park benches. And on the other side of the playground sits an idle bus. Inside. The bus driver is waiting to start his morning route. The person in the woods crouches. They pull a paper note out of the duffel bag and attach it to a nearby tree branch. Then they go back to the duffel bag and pull out the sniper rifle. They get low to the ground and lay flat on their stomach. They set up the rifle on the cold leafy floor and set their aim towards the driver of the bus. 
So now we get to the morning of October 22nd, which is day number 21. 556 in the morning. This is retired Maryland State Police Lieutenant David Reichenbaugh. He says that a Jamaican American bus driver named Conrad Johnson was training a new female driver. Johnson was standing up just inside the entrance of the bus, on the other side of the meter where riders pay. He was talking to the trainee and getting ready to start his day. As he was prepping his bus, he was shot and killed. The shot came from a wooded area. This bus stop shooting would be the 13th attack since October 2nd. I visited the spot and was joined by Nick DiCarlo, a retired Montgomery County detective sergeant who responded to the shooting that morning. I learned from officers on the scene what happened, who the victim is, and where he's been transported. And we have one witness. I have one of my investigators take a statement from that witness. It would have been the woman, the trainee, who was on the bus with Conrad Johnson. One of the keys at this point in time in the task force was the, as you know, the involvement of federal agencies, one of those agencies being the ATF. Once we had ATF come on the scene, they used their laser technology to give us a trajectory, show us exactly where the shot came from. That led us to the edge of the woods here. I orchestrated and conducted a line search of probably about 20 to 30 officers' agents along this wood line. And so we went, uh, I'm going to say, 25, 30 yards uh, into the woods where we found a note stuck on a tree limb. And we also found a discarded duffel bag, which would have been useful in carrying a long gun. DiCarlo remembers that this shooting felt like coming full circle. The bus stop was only a mile down the road from the very first shooting, where James Martin was killed at the shopper's food warehouse. DiCarlo had also been on that scene three weeks prior. He says police had learned a lot of lessons between then and now. A homicide involving a rifle in the outdoors, very unusual. But when you use a high-powered weapon like that, your crime scene has to expand. If you know that's what you're dealing with, the scope of your crime scene grows immensely. Now that we knew what we were dealing with, fast forward to Mr. Johnson and this scene, we knew we were dealing with a large area that had to be closed off in a number of different directions and a lot further than you typically would do at a homicide. By the time they had finished searching the scene, they had found a duffel bag, a single glove, and another note attached to a tree in the woods. Here's David Reichenbaugh again. Again, a note is found. This time it's an angry note. For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. You did not respond to the message. You departed from what we told you to say, and you departed from the time. Your incompetence has cost you another life. You have until 9 a.m. to deliver the money, and until 8 a.m. to deliver this response to let us know that you have our demands. Quote, we have caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. The same red sticky stars on top of the note claiming that, you know, we, we screwed them over and we weren't talking to them. And the body counts from then on was on us, not on them. The note set new deadlines for a phone call and for money. But by the time police had secured and read the note, they'd missed the deadline. The note also told police to send a false message to the public that police had caught the snipers like a duck in a noose. That's where the, the media comes back in, because now we send Chief Moose back out, giving them some phrases that they put on the note so that they know we were serious. One of the phrases that the chief used, and I'm sure the media was maybe a little astonished by it, was, You asked us to say, quote, we have caught a sniper like a duck in a noose, end quote. We understand that hearing us say this is important to you. However, we want you to know how difficult it has been to understand what you want because you have chosen to use only notes, indirect messages, and calls to other jurisdictions. The solution remains to call us and get a private toll-free number established just for you. If you are reluctant to contact us, be assured that we remain ready to talk directly with you. Our word is our bond. Let's talk directly. We are waiting for you to contact us. Sort of giving them, okay, now, we give. We know you're in charge. We're going to do whatever it is you want us to do. But we need you to call us. So reach out to us. We'll make it work. Basically, what the chief was trying to do was bide some more time for us to track these guys down because the chief knew that you know, all the leadership knew that we were starting to focus. We, we now knew their names. So we were trying to communicate through the media back to the snipers to have them reach out to us. That was a role that the news media willingly but cautiously took on. Here's Channel 9 reporter Dave Statter. A lot of information was being transmitted through the news media. We didn't know if the snipers were paying attention to us in the news, but it was clear that we were getting information out there that could be going to the snipers specifically. We knew we had a responsibility to be as accurate as we can be as we always are, but Statter says local journalists don't want to just regurgitate what police were telling them. He says sometimes police have an agenda, and they put out false information as a means to an end. And so the media has to be careful. 
If they were to broadcast false information, it would blow back on them and not law enforcement. When you are the news media and you are a reporter, you don't want to become the news, that's for sure. Still, Channel 9 and other local stations aired nearly every press conference by Montgomery County Police. In another press conference that day, on October 22nd, Chief Moose revealed the contents of the previous letter found at the Ponderosa Steakhouse shooting in Ashland, Virginia. There continues to be a great deal of speculation as to a reference, a threat in the message previously received. As stated earlier, everyone knows that all of our citizens are and have been at risk. We recognize the concerns of the community and therefore are going to provide the exact language in the message that pertains to the threat. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. My impression of why Charles Moose went out with that information was one, he likely knew it was going to leak out to the press, and in fact, it already had started leaking out to the press, including me. Also, they knew if there's a specific threat to children, and they didn't let the public know there's a specific threat to children, that this could be a problem for them down the road. Chief Moose also indirectly referenced a demand from the Ponderosa letter that money be deposited into a credit card the snipers were supposedly carrying. The sniper's request for $10 million had not been made public, but Statter says it had leaked to the media. It seemed bizarre to us as reporters. Suddenly, there's a request for a large amount of money. $10 million. And we can't make sense of it. We know that to get that money, you're going to have to somehow show yourself. Clearly, you don't want to be caught from what you're doing now. All of it's not making a lot of sense to us. What's the motive behind this? Was it really money? But police, we didn't know at the time, were actually getting a little bit closer in what this was about. The media didn't know it yet, but police had made significant progress on tracking down the snipers, now believed to be John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. Here's former FBI agent Linda Hooper again. It certainly looked like they were two viable suspects in this case, but we had no information that they were in Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, D.C. area at all. What they did is they were looking for that name, John Mohammed. Had that name ever been queried by any law enforcement in our area? And it's called an offline search. And based on that offline search, they got information that in Silver Spring, Maryland, they had queried John Mohammed. October 23rd, 2002. Early in the morning, U.S. Marshal Billy Sarukas asked the FBI to find out if John Muhammad or Lee Boyd Malvo had any interactions with law enforcement in the D.C. area. So the FBI went to NCIC, the National Crime and Information Center. NCIC has one of the most extensive crime-related databases in the country. Police use this database to get information on a driver when they run a tag. That information comes back, who the owner of the car is, information on that person, criminal history, that sort of thing. We didn't have any of that. This is former FBI agent Linda Hooper. She says that because they didn't have a tag number to run, they couldn't access Muhammad's vehicle history. But they could do an offline search or reverse NCIC to see if John Muhammad's name had come up in any local police reports. And they're able to get information that you couldn't get through running it through your dispatcher. As a result of the offline search, the FBI discovered that John Muhammad had been pulled over in Silver Spring, Maryland, as well as in multiple other nearby locations in the last month. Here's retired Montgomery County Police Commander Drew Tracy. And one of the most important traffic stops was in Baltimore, Maryland, where John Muhammad was stopped by a patrol officer. And he ran him, and uh, if I remember correctly, John Muhammad was saying, oh, he's out visiting relatives, and he was tired, he was sleeping at the gas station. From that traffic stop, we got information. Police learned that John Muhammad had been pulled over on October 8th in Baltimore, Maryland. Shortly after the officer stopped John Muhammad, he cued his dispatch microphone. Over the radio, he announced the make and model of the car as well as the license plate number. But the recording of that dispatch call was hidden in hours worth of tape. Deputy marshals listened to more than five hours of police radio call tapes before they heard the transmission they were searching for, an officer reading off the license and description of the car. Well, the information that came back was that he was driving this blue Chevrolet Caprice with New Jersey tags, and they provided the tag number for it. The snipers were driving a blue Chevrolet Caprice with New Jersey tags. Chevy Caprices are long, boxy cars with big trunks, and they were used by many law enforcement agencies in the 1990s as police cars. David Reichenbaugh says that even though the Caprice was stopped multiple times during the sniper investigation, police had no reason to suspect that it was involved in the shootings. There were no warrants, no reason to stop the vehicle, and after all, we're all looking for white vans and white trucks. We had stopped every white van in three states at least three times. They're not in a white van. 
police had spotted them either before or after the shootings and just didn't make the connection because we were so focused on the white vans and the white trucks. But by October 23rd, law enforcement had the snipers' names, their car, and their license plate number. And although they couldn't directly connect Muhammad to the crimes, they were able to secure a warrant for his arrest. That day was really spent putting everything that we had together. By about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, we had it. We knew who we were looking for. We knew what they were in. We just didn't know where to find them. So the next move was to inform everyone involved in the investigation. Here's former FBI agent Linda Hooper again. They put a bolo out to be on the lookout to tell all law enforcement, and not just in Maryland and Virginia, but to tell all law enforcement, if you see this blue Chevy Caprice with these New Jersey tags, you need to pull it over and identify if there's a John Muhammad driving it, and then there's an arrest warrant for him. So it goes out. So everybody knows. And then, like at every briefing, at every police department, particularly in the area, okay, this is what we're looking for tonight. As I recall, we had over 23 police agencies involved, and that's local, state, county, federal. We had, at the height, over 1,000 police officers working this case. It was around the clock because we knew these people were going to continue to kill people until they were stopped. The cooperation among the agencies were unprecedented. I had FBI officials working for me as a state trooper. I had county folks working for me. I had my troopers taking orders from FBI. It didn't matter. It was a joint effort in every true sense of the word. Then the egos start to click in a little bit, and there became a bone of contention. When do we release the information about the Caprice to the media? There's a lot of reasons, pro and con. Pro, obviously, hey, we've got the eyes of the public out there helping us find this blue Caprice. That's obvious. Public has a right to know. Now, this is what we're looking for. Help us find them. The downside of it was, hey, the snipers don't know that we've got them yet. They don't know that we have them pinpointed. So if we keep it secret, we've got a chance to maybe gain that element of surprise. That was a tough decision to make. Reichenbaugh says he wanted to release the information before anyone else got hurt. In his mind, the sooner the info went out, the sooner they would find and catch the killers. But not everyone agreed, including the federal authorities. At a task force meeting that night, Reichenbaugh says all the different agencies were arguing about what to do. So he stepped out of the meeting to call Dave Mitchell, superintendent of the Maryland State Police. Briefed him on what we had, and he very quickly made the decision for me. We don't care about anybody else. We're releasing it. We're releasing it to uh, the media. We need to find these guys, and we need to do it now. And I said, Colonel, I'm going to be in trouble when I go in here and tell these guys that. They're all feds. He said, well, you tell them it's from the order of the governor. That trumps them. We're doing it. Get some flyers, and in his words, get the hell out of there. I said, yes, sir. The license plate info went out to the media, and news outlets were getting ready to make it public. Here's Channel 9 reporter Dave Statter. They're making the connection, and one of our reporters, the same reporter who came up with the tarot card, Stacey Cohan, is the first to find this information out for us at Channel 9. She's got sources telling her that they're getting close, that they have names, and that they have a vehicle that they're looking for. So we knew that they had very specific information that would soon come out, and it did come out, that they were looking for two people, and they were looking for a vehicle, this 1990 blue Chevrolet Caprice. I was actually in a restaurant at that point, eating dinner when this started to break. And I'm talking to Stacy on the phone and seeing Fox News on the TV, Brian Wilson start to break the information. I called our assignment desk. I said, you know, there's a lot of specific information out here. I think this is going to break tonight. Just my gut. I'll work overnight and see if it turns up anything in the Washington area. Meanwhile, Statter says they had other leads to follow up on. One of the places we went to around midnight was Clinton, Maryland. We had learned that these shooters had a connection, or at least one shooter, John Muhammad, to his ex-wife who lived in Clinton, Maryland, a woman I believe her name was Mildred. Well, when we were investigating John Muhammad, we discovered that he was divorced and his wife, Mildred Muhammad, was living in the area and that she had a restraining order against him. They had three children. Mildred's restraining order against John meant that he couldn't carry firearms. So once police received the tip from Robert Holmes that Muhammad was carrying a rifle, police could arrest him and they could detain Malvo as a material witness. When I found out that she was living nearby where these shootings had taken place, I thought that we needed to go over and interview her and offer to move her and her children out of their house. October 23rd, FBI and ATF knock on my door. And they said, is Mildred Muhammad here? I said, nah, she's not here. <laughs> I was scared. I didn't know what they wanted. I said, nah, she's not here. They said, well, we really need to talk to her because we need to ask her some questions. I said, okay, that's me. So when was the last time 
you've seen John Allen Muhammad. And my palms began sweating. I said, why are you asking me questions about John? They said, well, we just want to know when was the last time you seen him. I said, September 2001 at an emergency custody hearing in Tacoma, Washington. And he says, we're going to name your ex-husband as the sniper. I said, what? John? My head hit the table. They said, yes, but, but do you think he would do something like this? I raised my head and looked in the corner of the room. I said, well, yeah. I said, well, why would you think of that? I said, because we were watching a movie. And I don't remember the name of it. But he said, I could take a small city, terrorize it. They would think it would be a group of people and it would only be me. I asked him, why would he do something like that? And he changed the subject. He said, well, Ms. Muhammad, would you like to go into protective custody? I said, you got to ask me that? Well, yes, ma'am, because some people don't want to go. I said, okay. Have you caught him yet? No, ma'am. Do you know where he is? No, ma'am. And you still have to ask me? She accepted our offer. We moved her and her children to a hotel. We get out of the house, into the car, drive away, and the media, a convoy, is coming up. They perch themselves around the house. My neighbor said that you would have thought it was daylight. They took us to a hotel where I still don't know where it is. We rented the hotel room in an undercover capacity, so her name wasn't associated with it at all. And we just kept her there until this was over. And I turned on the TV, and that was the first time they showed John's picture on TV. And I went up to the TV and put my hand on it and said, what happened to you? My son crying on one bed. My daughter's crying on the other. I pulled them together. They cried themselves to sleep. I got a pillow, went in the bathroom, turned on the water in the bathtub, sat on the floor, and screamed in the pillow because I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know who to call. Back at Mildred Muhammad's house in Clinton, Maryland, reporter Dave Statter was part of the media convoy that had showed up that night. We pulled way back when we saw police were already in the area, and police were there to see if John Muhammad showed up. Different news outlets broadcasted the Blue Caprice info at various points throughout the night. And now that the license plate had gone public, police hoped that someone would spot the car and call it a tip. While we were down there in the Clinton area, we got a call from a photographer who worked at a TV station in Baltimore, Maryland, who was heading home and said, police have I-70 shut down in Frederick County, Maryland, and he believes it's connected to the sniper shootings. Frederick County is just northwest of Montgomery County in Washington, D.C. It's where Maryland State Police Lieutenant David Reichenbaugh lived, and he was heading home that night. I guess it was probably 1130. I switched over to uh, Frederick Barrick Channel, and I called the Barrick as I'm required. And I said, car 662, Frederick, be advised I'm in the area. The uh, duty sergeant, Sergeant Hunter Mark, comes on and says, copy that 662, uh, can you go to secure Channel 1? And I knew something was up. I switched over to Channel 1, and I got on the radio, and uh, Sarge says, uh, be advised, we've got the broadcast out there. We just heard it on the local AM radio station five minutes ago, and I just got a phone call. The 1990 blue Caprice that you all are looking for is sitting at the rest area, Route 70 westbound on South Mountain. They're in Frederick. The snipers are in the rest area in Myersville. Next time on Monster, DC Sniper. They had surprise for 21 days. Now we had surprise. I wasn't anticipating this ending well. Once they realized they were cornered, I knew we were in for a shootout. I just knew it. I'm in the woodline, I'm listening, I'm praying that there's no shots fired. My heart's running a mile a minute and I hear the breaking of windows. I remember feeling this immense relief and then just disbelief when the information came out that it was an older guy and a young guy. Like, a young guy? A young guy did this? Why? This kid just looked at me with that dead shark eye look, but pal, I'd kill you and everybody here if I had the chance. This is the blue caprice. Not a white box? Not a white box. When the snipers started randomly shooting people, nobody said, oh, you know, this could be related to what happened to Paul. Nobody, nobody had reason to think that until they found my computer. Monster DC Sniper is a 15-episode podcast hosted by Tony Harris and produced by iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV. Matt Frederick and Alex Williams are executive producers on behalf of iHeartRadio, alongside producers Trevor Young, Ben Kiebrick, and Josh Thane. Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright are executive producers on behalf of Tenderfoot TV, alongside producers Meredith Stedman and Christina Dana. Original music is by Makeup and Vanity Set. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first two seasons, Atlanta Monster and Monster the Zodiac Killer. 
If you have questions or comments, email us at monster at iheartmedia.com or you can call us at 1-833-285-6667. Thanks for listening.